You can't find what appeals to people through market research because they themselves don't know until they've seen it. Mm. And so this is why you need much more experimentation in architecture because it's only when you experiment that you discover what people really want. Episode 100. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And this week we have a super special episode because this episode is episode 100 and to celebrate this momentous occasion I have the brilliant Rory Sutherland who is the vice chairman at Ogilvy UK he's a TED global speaker he's the author of alchemy the surprising power of ideas that don't make sense which is an absolutely brilliant book one of the best books I've ever read on behavioral economics on marketing and on advertising highly recommended and um, I had the good fortune just before lockdown to sit down and speak with Rory about well, we spoke about everything from isochronic maps to Londonist propaganda to um, how cool is the, the currency to compete against wealth and really we were getting under the skin of like how important brand can be to architecture and how to communicate um, the huge value that designers bring to property, to buildings. And Rory wonderfully breaks it down into saying that property has four types of value, use value, investment value, delight value, and stability value. And he goes into this in a lot of depth and just brings a huge wealth of ideas and anecdotes into how we as architects can be more powerful in the way that we communicate our value. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the absolute brilliance of Rory Sutherland. This episode was filmed and recorded at the stunning Forza showroom on Great Portland Street in London. You can see the gorgeous Water Knoll collection that Rory and I are sitting on. So thank you very much to the team for making that happen. You can see their website details in the information of this podcast. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Brilliant. Rory, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute privilege and a pleasure to have you on the show. No, I'm a fanboy, so it's actually a privilege for me to be here because I'm a bit of an architectural groupie, so uh, Excellent. you couldn't have stopped me coming on. Wonderful. And I noticed that you're, you're a trustee of the Benjamin Franklin House and That's the Ro 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 Rochester Cathedral, so you've, you're kind of in there with looking after architecture and preserving it and being... It's the most undervalued um, contributor to uh, life happiness. And by the way, I'm not alone in saying this. Um, Shlomo Benazzi at UCLA, yeah. um, uh, he's a very, very good behavioural scientist. And one of the things he noticed very rapidly is that uh, good design makes a contribution to your well-being, uh, which is never properly accounted for. Yes. And I often half-humorously ask the question, you know, that countries like Denmark, which report very high levels of happiness and reasonable levels of egalitarianism. Mm. I think a large contribution there is, a, is made by the built environment and the designed environment. Yeah. I have a little joke about Denmark, and I always call this the Sutherland Index, which is, 
in different countries, when you go to the loo and you need to do a number two, okay, and you go to a public lavatory or a restaurant lavatory and you close the door and, of course, you need to hang your jacket somewhere, what are the odds that there's a hook on the back of the door? And in <laughs> countries with a high design ethos like Denmark, the Sutherland Index is basically 999 Okay. <laughs> and then in disorderly countries, it'll fall as low as, you know, 15 or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And uh, uh, the other thing that really interests me is I think we can apply quite a lot of the same things that are often applied to consumer marketing or to consumer product design to architecture. And what I'd love to do, you know, this will be my retirement project, is use it to justify and to make the economic case for... What, what I often call the extra 10% that makes all the difference, but is the first to get cut when the finance director gets involved. Yes. Because the things that emotionally make a difference, emotionally make a difference precisely because they're slightly pointless. I mean, when I say pointless, they're very, very valuable, but they're pointless to the utilitarian mindset. Yes. Yeah. And so in, in, in product marketing, this was there's a wonderful thing called Carnot theory. Now, very interesting. That probably hasn't made its way. Carnot theory probably hasn't made its way from consumer electronics. So Professor Carnot at the University of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see his work reflected in the 1980s consumer electronics, Japanese consumer electronics market. And he makes a point that there are three separate components to a thing. Now, I would apply this to a building, by the way, and I'd also apply it to a cassette deck. Right. And there are threshold attributes where they have to be present. If they're not present, you're furious and unsatisfied, but their presence gives you no delight. So, you know, a, a non-leaking roof, for example, or in the case of you buy a brand of milk, uh, if you find the carton leaks and you buy the same brand again and the carton leaks again, you'll never buy it again. But nobody goes, I always buy this brand because the carton doesn't leak, okay? You treat that as table stakes. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a standard. It's a then you have performance attributes. And the relationship between performance attributes with something like a cassette deck, that'll be sound quality, battery life. They're things you can measure quite often mm. using objective measurements. And the relationship between performance attribution and consumer happiness is linear. And then there's a third thing, which is the delight attribute, which is supralinear, which is it's not actually necessary. No one will be necessarily angry at its absence, but its presence, even though it may look slightly gratuitous, creates a disproportionate amount of human well-being, delight and uh, excitement. And now the classic example of this would be, I always say, if you bought a cassette deck in the 80s, you're too young for this, okay? The way you chose it, yes, you cared a bit about sound quality, battery life, build quality, all those things. But what you what really determined your decision was you pressed the eject button. <laughs> and if it went clack, that was manifestly rubbish and you weren't going to give it house. If it to... Whereas if there was a glorious, damped, counterweighted mechanism where the thing hissed open with a kind of, you know, balletic performance. A bow, almost. Yeah, it was, it, exactly. <laughs> and the same with a DVD player, you see. And my architectural equivalent of Carnot delight attributes, um, I always give the example, and it's a marketing example, mm. when they opened St Pancras Station, uh, uh, Freud Communications, very good PR agency, um, every single press release contained the extraordinarily irrelevant fact about a railway station that it contained the longest champagne bar in Europe. Now... You know, this is a bit like the eject mechanism, okay? No one ever says, I'm thinking of going to a champagne bar. Do you mean long ones? You know, or I don't go to the champagne bar anymore. It's not long enough, okay? It's a totally nonsensical superlative. And yet, what it did was, first of all, 15 years later, it must be more than that, actually, mm. but certainly 15 years later, everybody still remembers that fact because it somehow sticks in the mind. And secondly, what it said was, this isn't just a utilitarian transit hub. This station is a destination in its own right. Yeah. And a place which you might visit even if you don't need to catch a train. And it also, by the way, makes a visit to St Pancras kind of uplifting. Mm. 
And it contributes to a wider general sort of... And I think, by the way, that was an effective message also in attracting the kind of businesses that have opened in St. Frank. Yes. There's a Harrods, and that's partly the Eurostar. John and, Lewis, yeah. I think there's an espresso shop. Mm, lovely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pretty safe, I think, with an architectural <laughs> audience in praising Nespresso. Uh, Defi- I, I, most I, I, definitely. Yeah, most I, think, definitely. I, think, I think that's a fairly safe uh, little uh, fan, fanboy admission. Um, now... If you look at a place where they spent more money, which is London Bridge Station, yeah. okay, they've, they've probably more or less got right to the basic attributes, although the toilet provision is disastrous. Okay? Um, I think it's much more efficient you know, in terms of you know, changing, planes and the, uh, changing trains and the movement of people. Yeah. Uh, the signage is, is, was quite bad, but it, it is now better. But they completely missed the champagne bar effect. So what I would have done if you'd given me that brief is I would have said, let the architects and the throughput experts get on with all their stuff. Take two or three retail outlets that will otherwise end up being an Oliver bonus or a paper chase. Yeah. And just say, okay, we're going to have London's largest florist. Mm. And you might actually give the real estate away to, you know, or, I mean, you know, you could do some really eccentric things, you know. I mean, I always thought that Marlebone Station and the extraordinary cult following that the Chiltern line has yeah. is partly because Marlebone Station had a speciality cheese shop, you know. So in other words, don't allow market forces to create the sort of generic retail that you find yeah. everywhere else. Go out on a limb and create one or two real eccentricities. So when you came down the escalators, there was a massive display of flowers. And now, bear in mind, of course, that Joe Public when judging architecture, doesn't have your vocabulary. Yes. So Joe Public, when you say, what do you think of the new station, they don't talk about architraves, okay, or spandrels, or whatever <laughs> it is you chaps like to go on about, right? Um, so what they will say is, I really like the florists when you come down the escalator. Now, once you've got that, you've kind of won. You know, they're on your side, they want to like you, and they're looking for confirmatory evidence to like you more. If you don't provide that first kind of little reason to like then you end up as kind of... And, and the, my point about the, the, the florist idea, I know and I sympathise because realistically, that's the first thing that any finance guy would kill, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. The yeah. first thing he'd well, kill. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make logical sense. No, it, it, precisely because delight attributes, and I think this is true of architecture, um, they either, they, they're either surprisingly peripheral to the main function of something or they serve a function which we're not consciously aware of in some cases. I mean, I've always jokingly said about classical architecture, <laughs> this is a very funny thing, which was um, a group of people trying to find the entrance to the Purcell rooms at the South Bank, and we couldn't find the door. Now, say what you like about classical architecture, but nobody walks up to the <laughs> British Museum and goes, I wonder where the entrance is. So, you know, it's always <laughs> worth remembering that great architecture also contains clues to its own use. Yes. Which yeah. we may only process unconsciously. Yeah. So it may be that a lot of the delight of architecture is created by just unconscious forces as well. Totally, totally. But, but I mean, the fact that it contributes to happiness, um, we move to a Robert Adam house, we live in the roof, we pay no premium for the grade oneness. Uh, what we're paying for is location and square footage. No premium is paid for the capability brown view or the um, Robert Adamness of the actual architecture. Um, cause I know this to my neighbours and economists. And I said, I don't understand why we're effectively buying art for free yeah. when we live here. There, there was an apartment in Notting Hill, which was a gropious thing. Um, and that went for no more than the surrounding... I think it was half Gropius Crystal Fry. Would that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that went for no premium. Obviously, it's bloody expensive because it's yeah. in Notting Hill. Yeah. It suddenly occurred to me that there's it, it, a... It's bonkers. Th- this is the cheapest way of buying art, okay? Mm. Now, if we could just create and b- persuade punters, huge hats off to websites like themodernhouse.net. Yes, the, the kind of... Now, you're not helped, architects, by the fact that rich people don't have fantastic taste, by and large, okay? Um, but equally, they can be educated. I mean, rich people tend to buy pretty good wine, not because they know a lot about wine, but because expert opinion has, from the wine industry has permeated down to Russian oligarchs. And so they know to mix Chateau Latour with Coca-Cola rather than, <laughs> rather than mixing Beaujolais Nouveau. Okay. Now, um, if you could create something where architecture became almost collectible, Mm. Um, and it was as much a, uh, 
a repository of value, D- architecture and design, and just design quality, yeah. was as much a repository of value as location, you'd revolutionise the whole property market. Because at the moment, once everybody believes that it's all about location and square footage, all the financial gains go to the landowner. And the architect is basically a cost, not a source of value creation. E- exactly. And, and, and this is the, the perennial problem with, with architecture, you know, the kind of constant complaint is that our mm. fees are so low. When I, when I said that I was... It was in- hugely undervalued in terms of the value you create. Yes. Yeah, no doubt about and, it. And, yeah. and when I said I was interviewing you on the show, I did a little kind of call out onto, the, onto our Twitter followers and uh, other followers. Everyone asked the same question. How do we communicate this value of the design that we bring uh, to, to architecture rather than it always being seen as a cost? And then we end up getting trapped in the kind of time-based... You know, we sell our, we sell our time, basically. I mean, if you could create a Robert Parker score for architecture, where buildings were generally appraised on their architectural quality, you probably, I mean, I don't know if this is possible, who on earth would do it? But th- one of the problems is that um, there's a great phrase in business, what gets measured gets managed. But the problem mm. is what gets mismeasured gets mismanaged. And the metrics that are used are location. Now, by the way, we've been an extraordinary beneficiary of this because our offices in Ogilvy are in Sea Container's house, okay, which overlooks the Godam River and Blackfriars Station, which I think is the best new station in London by some measure. And uh, when we were first told there's an opportunity in Sea Container's house, I said, we won't stand a chance being able to afford that because, you know, Goldman Sachs, Prancing or whatever. Weirdly... South of the river on that bank does not count as prime London commercial real estate. Bonkers. Fuck, right? So, so it's got a view of the Godam River. How is that not prime real estate? But now the Victoria development will be treated as prime, for example, but this isn't. Mm. Okay. Mm. Now, the metrics in all forms of architecture, you know, um, Britain has suffered, by the way, in another way in residential architecture. Um, uh, in... Um, uh, effectively having this obsession with the number of bedrooms. So that's a deformity. If you go to countries where it's square footage or square meterage, like Germany or the United States, um, one, you get a much more intelligent allocation of space. You get more toilets. That's the one thing you notice, okay? Yeah. Um, uh, and also, you get a vastly more intelligent allocation of space because I've always argued, the Americans have this slightly weird thing about the master bedroom, don't they, where you practically, if you want to go to the toilet in the night, you have to set up a kind of base camp halfway there because <laughs> the bloody main bedroom is so enormous. Yeah. But to be honest, if you've got one big room in a house, you've solved quite a lot of problems. How big the bedrooms are, you know, is, becomes less important. So the number of bedrooms thing, I think, has created a huge deformity in British property. Mm. Rather than square footage, it's caused people to chase the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, uh, and so that, and I also think that the, I mean, to be honest, the quality of our building isn't first rate, which doesn't help. I mean, by and large, build quality is pretty second rate in this country, I think. Yeah. My, my friend Ray Falk, who is an architect I, I was uh, very friendly with at university, he always recommended buying Edwardian housing because he said uh, the technology was pretty good, but you still had cheap labour before the First World War ruined everything. And um, uh, also, of course, architecturally, we suffer from extraordinary... What I didn't realise is Frankfurt, there's practically no property, regula- property regulation. Germans find it very, very easy to build their own mm. houses. Um, uh, and the um, extraordinary uh, restriction on uh, individual or niche house building and the extraordinary restriction on being able to build eccentrically yeah. uh, is undoubtedly a massive limiting factor here. Yes. I, mean, I was talking to a Canadian developer who went to Islington Council and wanted to effectively sell or rent micro-housing. Now, for some reason, if you call it student housing, that's fine. Now, here's an interesting question. Why is it okay for students to live in really small places? Where, by and, by and large, by the way, they're quite happy, okay? But if you're a third-year employee at Ogilvy, uh, it's illegal to build that property for you. Yeah. And so he basically said, look, there's huge pressure in the market for this kind of smaller but centrally located thing. And he was told by the council, it's not about what people want, it's about what we think they need. 
And so there are limitations there to greater inventiveness. Now, you know, you might argue if you live in a very central location in a city, uh, the city actually provides a large part of your living space. Yeah. And what you need is a bolt hole. I also find it interesting, I've talked to a few architects about this, saying that technology changes our perception of space mm. because it enables our mind to be elsewhere. And so I mean, television must have done that to an extent, okay? Okay, that kind of virtual... But a, a very interesting friend of mine who had to, for years, a very weird job where he had to spend Friday and Monday once a month in Mumbai, which meant he basically had to stay the weekend there. And... The place he was visiting was on the outskirts of Mumbai, so it wasn't even in the middle of the city. Yeah. And he said, before the internet came along, he said, my weekend spent on this industrial estate on the city outskirts, where he said, you know, it was sensory deprivation. It was intolerable. He said, once they got high-speed broadband and I had the internet, he said, you know, I'm Skyping my daughter, you know, I'm reading books, I'm watching films on Netflix. The, the, that same feeling of imprisonment has completely disappeared yeah. once I can take my mind somewhere else. Mm. I always talk, tell the story that when, because your younger viewers won't, won't understand this, but when you first went to a hotel room in, on a business trip in 1989, you went up to your hotel room, and bear in mind, there was, you could watch foreign television or read a book, that was it. Uh, you basically went to the hotel room, you opened the door, slung your suitcase through the door, didn't enter the room at all, closed the door and went down to the bar. Because sitting on your own in the hotel room was intolerable. Yes. And now nobody does this. They get their laptop out, they start charging things. And so what property is, you know, um, you know what we need from space, just as if you think about it, dining rooms were a kind of dying thing to an extent mm. in that people eat in the kitchen and there's nothing abnormal about that. You know, it isn't Downton Abbey, for God's sake. Garages used to be considered necessary, but modern cars basically don't rust. Yeah. And in the same way, our, what our need for space is probably changes quite a lot. Yeah. But then there's the other thing. So the two ways you can actually stop the landowner, or three ways. I can see three ways of stopping the landowner getting all gains, okay? One of them is building very, very high. Uh, another one is building very, very small. Yes, and of course, the two aren't mutually exclusive. You could build very high and very small. Um, I suppose a third way would be shared ownership or fractional ownership to an extent. Yeah. Okay. And a fourth way would be branding, where the primary decision you take is around what kind of house you buy, not where it is. Mm. So, for example, if someone decides that the creative director of our Frankfurt office used to live in a Huff house, I think he still does. Now, if you say, I want to live in a Huff house, actually, that's a case where location is no longer the primary discriminator and the nature of the accommodation or how it's designed or built mm. therefore rises higher up the what, what in choice architecture is called the elimination by attribute hierarchy. Yeah. And so if you're, if you're buying a car... I'm fairly... Now, of course, it'll be a Volvo because you're an architect. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> what, you know, what, what, what is the compulsory architect's car now? It, it varies, doesn't it? But, um, no, it, but if you're buying Bicycles. A car, buy, of course, yeah, <laughs> Bicycles, a fixie. Yes. You've got to have a fixie. A fixie okay. or a Brompton. But if you went to buy a car, you'd have a preconception of the brands you're interested in, yeah. which would enable you to make an elimination. To, say, to make the choice manageable, you go, mm, you'd probably eliminate four or five brands for whatever reason. Now, that means that brand is quite important. Owning a car brand is quite important because it's a fairly early on mm. um, decisive factor in people's choice. If people go to prime location and they go where it is, how much it costs, how many bedrooms it's got, does it have a greenhouse? And then they only look at the picture and make a judgment about architecture or design quality at stage seven, okay? Um, the gains aren't going to the architect. Yeah. Because it's then treated in the decision-making process as an also-ran factor. Mm. And so if you could get people... So my example would be, let's take Ebbsfleet Station, okay, which is in a weird kind of way... If you look at a different kind of map of London, which is the isochronic map, have you ever seen those no. things? So an isochronic map is a great thing. You put where your workplace is, right. okay, and then you choose acceptable modes of transport, and then you have a slider, and it says, show me all the places that are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes from work. 
It's very strange because when you get out to about an hour from our office, there are still parts of southwest London, well inside the M25, which aren't illuminated. Yeah. But Ashford on, in Kent appears. It's only about half a mile around the railway station. But if you're prepared to live next to Ashford railway station, you could basically get to Blackfriars in an hour, change at St Pancras, Thames Link down. Now, in that respect, you could argue that Ebbsfleet, for example, um, uh, you know, an Ashford station, is almost magical. Ashford station is an hour and a bit from Paris and 30 minutes from London. Yeah. Okay. Now, if I went to any of my younger colleagues and said, why don't you move to Ashford? I'd have to put a gun to their head. <laughs> I'd have to put a gun to their head if I wanted them to move to Bromley or Orpington. They're obsessed with Shoreditch or Hoxton or whatever. Because to a degree, they've been fed urbanist propaganda. And as a result, Hoxton landowners benefit from their... I think it's, I, I think it's something to do with mating and reproduction. I think the truth of the matter is, if you say you live in Bromley, you can't it's pull. It's not cool. You can't pull, can you? Yeah, exactly. It, but, so it must be something weird. It, it, you know, so Hoxton and Shoreditch must be these sort of weird spawning grounds. <laughs> but nonetheless, they can actually afford pretty nice property. Right. Yeah. Now, let's say above Ashford Station, you built the coolest bloody building imaginable, mm. okay? Both in terms of design, technology, super fast broadband, um, and, and facilities. You've got a place that's actually, what, an hour and a half from Paris and 37 minutes from London, okay? Um, if you also did a deal with a railway company so that seven years of travel were factored into your purchase of the apartment, so you've got a seven-year season ticket with your purchase... Could you get young people to see that a combination of design and extraordinary um, travel potency yeah. beats Hoxton? I don't know. Yeah. Because you'd have to make it pretty damn cool. Which, I accept that. It, it's, it's, mm. it's interesting, actually, because it's, you know, in architecture, we often talk about the kind of growth of cities and that we often see that the areas that become very trendy or very uh, uh, very profitable places for people to develop are often started off by artistic communities yeah. and they're creative art, types. Uh, it's all, they're, they're the sort of shock troops of gentrification, aren't yeah, they? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. They yeah. kind of go out, it's cheap, they end up making it cool, um, not not necessarily deliberately so, or doing it with the kind of intention of bringing people to the area, just, but just because that's their, their culture and it's cheap and they want to build these sorts of areas. But it's quite easy, in a weird way. If you look at... Um, our material needs. Uh, one, one thing that, that, that fascinates me is you'd think the internet would have had quite a big effect on... Now, you need to... The problem is that cities are extraordinarily productive places because yes. of the extraordinary number of nodes of connection made possible. And so you need cities to earn a salary. Now, in terms of quality of life, the, what you might call the deficiency of stuff. I moved out to Seven Oaks when we had twins, okay. And the extent to which you suffer from moving out of London as a consumer rather than as a wage earner is vastly less than it would have been in 1990. Mm. I mean, I can remember going back to Monmouth um, uh, in, you know, in, let's say, 1992, you know, and you know, you had you know, you had a week without kind of any exotic ethnic foods. And when you were driving back along the West Way and you saw the sign saying West End the City, you know, you felt the milk of sort of human kindness flowing back. You know, you felt you know, alive again. Now actually, with the exception of restaurants, and even then, by the way, the um, that's evened out extraordinarily, you know, there are pretty good restaurants in provincial towns now, mm. if you and particularly ethnic or Indian restaurants, you can get really lucky. Yep. Um, online retail, you know, when I was a kid, growing up, Welsh Borders, you wanted to buy a weird piece of hi-fi equipment or some speakers. It was Cardiff or Bristol, you know, it was a 40-mile drive. Um, the, the way I was, I occasionally, living in Kent, I occasionally describe London as the inconvenient alternative to blue water. <laughs> um, but even further, if you think about it, London's got some fantastic shops there's the Selfridges website, there's the Fort Lauderdale Basin <laughs> website, you know, there's the John Lewis website. And funnily enough, those shops are exactly the same wherever else you happen to be. Yeah. So that, that obsession with city life is, is strange because it's happened at a time when technology has made it, the gains from living in a highly densely populated area are slightly less. You know, at Ocado, for example, um, uh, you know, you, you know it's, not, it's not that case where, I mean, I had a... a um, 
an Italian friend, whose father in the 1950s had to buy olive oil from a chemist because it was sold as both a skin treatment and to pour in your ear, but as a cooking ingredient, it was completely unknown. You know, we don't, list, we don't exist in culinary deserts anymore. Yeah. Um, and, um, and equally, actually, other technologies like the ability to watch the opera from the cinema mean that, uh, you know, you can... I mean, I ended up watching the Lemon trilogy. I couldn't get into the theatre. I couldn't even get into a cinema in Tunbridge Wells. I ended up driving down to Canterbury to watch it at the Curzon Cinema there. Yeah. Now, you know, um, you, I, mean, I, I, I was almost tempted, in fact, just out of sheer um, glorious incongruity... There was a live broadcast of the Magic Flute from the Royal Opera House, uh, I think the Odeon in Romford. And I always <laughs> thought that was... No, the idea, the idea of that was so gloriously in Congress, I always thought it would be much more interesting to go and see it there than to see it at the Royal Opera House. <laughs> and um, so, I mean, th- there's a strange thing. This, I mean, there has, I think, I would accuse the BBC in particular of, um, uh, of forcing urbanist, particularly Londonist propaganda yeah. down, you know, just by the nature of the people who live there, um, down people's throats. And actually, um, suburbia is really nice. I mean, I know this, everybody's pu- being a little bit sick, in the, your entire audience uh, blah, 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 a little bit sick in their mouths now. Yeah. But I had a friend who was an art, art director, and a man of very unusual taste. So he collected American muscle cars, which again, in yeah. kind of arty circles, is you know, a, a, a bit a of cool an abomination, you know. But he always believed that actually sort of 30s classic suburbia would, in the same way that hipsters made sort of beers like Pab's Blue Ribbon cool again, yeah. he always thought that suburbia would actually have a resurgence, that actually living in a sort of 1930s mock Tudor place in Orpington would become the coolest thing to do. <laughs> he, he's still waiting, it has to be said. He moved back to New Zealand, so he never had to test his I never saw it. Yeah. No, it but but I, I've always... I, I mean... It is worth questioning, of course, what happens with fashion. Yeah. And I'm always very... It's very funny because as a 54-year-old man, I find Shoreditch very confusing, okay? Because I walk around Shoreditch and part of it is 54-year-old bourgeois suburban me and part of it is kind of experimental tech-loving me. And so half my brain is going, oh, that's fantastic. There's 17 artisan coffee shops. And look, you know, you can get this extraordinary so-and-so. And then half of me is going... But it's a bit of a shithole, isn't it? There's like crap sprayed all over the walls. And I can't quite get my head around when I walk around Shoreditch. I imagine it'll be the same if I go to Brooklyn next week. You know, is this place great or is it terrible? Yeah. Um, but one interesting question would be, undoubtedly, if you could break the stranglehold of location. Mm. And it's worth remembering that there's location... Um, the tube map has a grossly deleterious effect on people's property um, choices in London because uh, the tube map it misrepresents London very badly. It, it totally hides, occludes South London, most of which operates by train or right. bus, yeah. but particularly train, in fact. And, of course, trains are non-stop in a way that tubes aren't. Yeah. So Bromley South is 15 minutes from Victoria. Now, no one looking at the tube map, well, Bromley South is not it, but, I mean, no one could get there. I, I could, when I first moved out to Kent, I couldn't get my head around this fact that you could get from Bromley to central London in 15 minutes. Um, so the tube map creates a huge distortion, I think. But if you could get people just to think more widely, someone told me the other day that if you allowed everybody to build within half a mile of every tube station and railway station in the southeast um, on what was not green belt land, but otherwise undeveloped, not particularly attractive land, yeah. I think you'd be able to create something like a million new homes. Yeah, like brownfield sites. and. Now, if you could get... Now, in order to do that, that's partly a marketing challenge, isn't it? Yeah. Because uh, you need to be able to get people to go, I'm, you, know, I'm, you know, Bromley North, you know, all those places, which in many cases, by the way, are closer to your place of work in commuting time than Fulham is. But every, because Fulham's on the tube, the, the inhabitants of Fulham have this totally delusional belief that they live in central London. Mm. Um, well, there's a perception of South London being disconnected. I mean, I grew up in, in Purley and Croydon yeah. and, and that area, and it's, there's, there's still the kind of perception of, well, it's not really London. It's, it's but of course, of... the interesting thing with, with, for example, Purley, or if you take, you know, Petswood, okay, 
you could get into three different London stations. So you can go into Blackfriars, I think you can go into Cannon Street, and you can go into Victoria. Yeah, yeah. Okay. London well, Bridge as well. Oh, oh, right, okay. So, uh, so actually, uh, essentially, you've got something which, you know, w without changing trains, you just pick which train you want, and you can be taken to four different bits of London. Yeah. That's something that the Tube doesn't allow you to do. Yeah. For the most part. And so, I mean, that's... That's another underexplored thing. But if you started developing places near the stations and you could somehow seed interesting communities, mm. because cool is an extraordinary thing, because cool is basically the currency that poorer, cleverer people use to compete with wealth. And eventually what happens, there's a great book by Douglas McWilliams called The Flat White Economy, and what tends to happen is the problem with rich people is they're not very cool. Yeah. And so if an area becomes too rich, it suffers by being becoming achingly uninteresting and cool because rich people generally have very conformist tastes. And so you compete against this by redefining what's important. And movements essentially create cool as a way to compete against posh, I guess. Yeah. You know, or or or, or wealthy. Yeah. And so if you could find a way of of knowing how how to petri dish cool. I'll give you the perfect example of cool as a trade-off for, 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 for rich, yeah. okay? Which is, <clears throat> I go to a, um, a conference with Amnesty International, okay, and they wanted me to speak there. Now, if you're Amnesty International, you can't just go and take over a five-star hotel and large it up because it's generally frowned on, yeah. okay? And so, amusingly, for Amnesty International, they held the conference in what had been a police station in East Berlin, but had been converted into a hotel. And the rooms were more or less cells, okay? I mean, uh, I'm pretty sure the, the walls were unplastered. They were just concrete walls. Floor was concrete with a bit of hessian matting. The shower, actually, your bed was on a platform on top of, there was so little space in the room, your bed was a platform on top of the shower. So you climbed up a ladder and went to sleep on a raised bed. Now, uh, the final touch was, utterly brilliant, which was, there was a black and white television in the room, it only had one channel, and the only thing the channel showed, then and now, because this is still going on, was the big Lebowski in continuous loop. Okay. <laughs> now, if you turned up expecting the Marriott, you would have had the worst weekend of your life, you know. But to me, <laughs> this is still one of the three best hotels. I've done my share of bling travel. Yeah. Still one of the three best hotels I've ever stayed at. Now, just to be a very clear point, this was not the only thing. In the middle of the hotel was a kind of hipster coffee shop, which I think was open 24 hours, which served pretty much the best coffee I've ever had in my life. So you can't make everything minimalist and ironic. You've got to have one or two things that are fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But one or two fantastic things. You know, what extent did Julie's wine bar uh, change Notting Hill? You know... Um, does it exist anymore? Probably doesn't. Does I don't it? think so. I, I don't go that far west anymore. <laughs> it's, you know, totally uncool. Um, but, um, but, but actually, if you could work out the ingredients fairly well, and it might also rely on the fact that you need to restrict who can buy and who can rent there. Because when people choose property, they're partly choosing a peer group and a neighbour group. Yeah. And part of the reason why... I'll give you an example of another brand. So if you own land in... Kensington. People don't want to live in Kensington because Kensington's great. They want to live in Kensington because lots of other people who are like them think Kensington is great. Therefore, if you want to disrupt Kensington, right, what you have to do is, it's not enough to change one person's mind because people are choosing a peer group for themselves. They're not choosing a, a location. Yeah. And so in order to disrupt, you have to change everybody's mind simultaneously, mm. which short of a neutron bomb is, is impossible. Is impossible. Yeah. The same applies to private schools and universities, okay? People want to go to the universities that are most respected, not by them, but by other people. And so university brands, property brands, school brands are very, very difficult to unseat. So they become these... It's, it's what's called a Keynesian beauty contest in economics, where everybody second-guessing everybody else. Right. So unless you can make everybody believe that everybody else has suddenly changed it, their it's mind... It's so rooted in agreement. It becomes right? completely rooted. Now, with property, of course, it does change over 20 or 30 years. Yeah. Um, so the daughter of a colleague of mine said to her dad, who's about my age, 
she needed a bit of help with her first uh, rental, said, Dad, I want to live in Peckham because it's really handy for Shoreditch. Now, if you'd said that in 1988, you would have been sectioned, okay? Um, but So it does change, but it's very, very slow. If you could find a way of accelerating that process. Mm. I'll tell you a lovely story, if, which is one guy who managed to do it, which is a guy called Sir Christopher Zeman, who was a mathematical genius, was given the brief to launch mathematics at the newly founded University of Warwick. And he said, look, I'm only prepared to run a maths faculty at your new university if I can be mentioned in the same sentence as, say, you know, Imperial stroke Oxford stroke Cambridge. He said, I'm not interested in running a second tier, third tier faculty. If I can't be plausibly mentioned in the same sentence as those people, I'm not doing it. Yeah. They said, fine, how do you do it? And he came, now, he came back with a very interesting proposal. Okay. He said, okay, what you want me to do, because this is what you're supposed to do when you start a maths mm. faculty, is hire 15 different academics in 15 different fields of mathematics. Now, if I do that, I will get fairly averagely good people. Right. Okay. Because the best people have got tenure at Yale or whatever it is. Okay. But he said, on the other hand, I, Christopher Zeeman, I'm putting words in his mouth, but his logic was... I'm basically the world's leading expert in, now I may have got this wrong, but it's something like matrix topology, okay, a particular field of mathematics. And he said, I can't hire particularly good mathematicians in other fields, but in matrix topology, I can't get you the second best person in the world, but I can get you the third, fifth, sixth, eighth, and ninth. Now, if you let me hire just matrix topologists, we could be the best place in the world for matrix topology, okay? And uh, they allowed him to do it, and sure enough, of course, you know, it immediately gets on the map because the combination of these eight people is just extraordinary. And then 10 years later, they go and hire, I'm not sure who it is, I'm making this shit, shit yeah. up mathematically, the best number theorist in the world. And he repeats the process, hiring the third, fifth. Now, all those people are perfectly capable of teaching undergraduate maths, okay, right? <laughs> They're not going to be going, oh shit, I've got, you know, oh shit, I've got to do calculus today, my brain hurts, right? <laughs> They're all perfectly capable of doing that stuff. And the brilliant thing is, if you want to compete with Eton, you can't. But if you want to be the, a, a, a place for music that's better than Eton, you can, right? You know, if you want to be a place that's better for sport than Eton, okay? There was that, what, what, what's that school that's full of, you know, you know, you can do that, right? And so what you have to do is take a very narrow focus, win on that, and then wait. So arguably, the way to do it if you were a property developer is, is to say, we have to do one extraordinary thing here. There has to be something here like the best coffee shop in the world. And that will make the place a re an acceptable reason to go and live there. Yeah. And as a result, then, bit by bit, you know, we'll start off with the world's best, and um, this is analogous, okay? Yes, the world's yeah. best coffee shop. And then we'll have the world, you know, two of the world, five years later, we'll open three great restaurants and so on and so forth. And it might be possible to seed coolness by doing it that way. In other words, you have to take one very narrow focus uh, and then he heavily ramp on that. Yes. Yeah. Because the great problem with property brands like public school brands and university brands is they're formed collectively. When you send your kids to school, you're buying them a peer group, yeah. really. You're not really buying them teachers, okay? Yeah, it's the culture. And, and it's so it's the, the whole cultural thing. And so you're buying not your own beliefs, but your assumption of everybody else's. Yes. And so doing that is a really difficult thing to change. But the bummer is, I mean, this is actually, by the way, it's not just a serious architectural question, it's a serious economic question. Mm. Because Henry George, in the 19th century, asked this question, how do we stop the landowners basically grabbing hold of all the gains that are produced by the super productivity of people living in cities? Yeah. And in London, I guess, a little bit of that, the, the underground was probably decisive in that by the underground and commuter rail was probably decisive in that it, it allowed the city to grow. Mm. And of course, area expands at the square of distance. Yeah. So it allowed the city to grow for a time where, um, you know, size wasn't the constraining factor. I mean, it's very interesting, by the way, um, American cities where there, there are two t American cities where you don't have a massive constraint around property prices tend to have two characteristics. They're not on the coast. So, in other words, they can expand in all four directions. Yeah. And the other thing is, they were mostly built after the car was invented. 
So this is, I'm going to, I already mentioned, what, what did I do that already scandalised architects by saying, oh, American muscle cars or whatever. No, um, I, I really like Phoenix, Arizona, because <laughs> the whole place, I met a guy, when I first went to Phoenix, I met a guy who was a tour guide at the Botanic Gardens in Scottsdale. And he was in his late 80s, I think. And he'd moved there in 1930, when the population of Phoenix was 30,000. Okay? Right. It was a town in the desert, okay? And it's now about, what, three million, three and a half million. Now, the great thing is that the whole town was built for the car. Now, in Phoenix, when you're driving along and you need to make a right or make a left, okay, nearly everywhere else in the world, you know, the guys turning left stop and everybody behind them has to stop. No, no. You just create an extra couple of lanes on each side. So anybody who wants to go right will chuck a couple of lanes in there. People going left will chuck a couple of lanes just, in there. And you can just... They synchronise the lights so you can flow into the centre of Phoenix if you maintain the speed limit. Right. You can basically get in in a single um, uninterrupted movement. Uh, Vegas would be another case. So they're, they're the places which had the worst property crash as well because there's no real constraint both on the directions in which they build. Yeah. But also, you live eight miles outside Vegas, you know, even more so when you're... Tesla Model 3 arrives, you know, you basically just sit back and flow into town. And just let it do itself, yeah. Um, uh, Mussolini, by the way, uh, wanted to, do you know this, he wanted to build, he thought that Venice was old-fashioned, having all these canals, and he wanted to build an autostrada straight down the Grand Canal. <laughs> um, uh, the awful embarrassing thing is that fascists are good at infrastructure, aren't they? It's one of the terrible embarrassing, you know, um, elements of world well, history. Exactly, and the, the military often brings... Yeah, I suppose them. it's the military mentality, isn't it? We won't have any of this nonsense. Exactly. It's fucking just, gondolas. We're just straight there. Yeah. straight down the yeah. middle. Um, but, um, but, it, but it's... Uh, it, it really interests me, which is that you could... I mean, cable cars or something similar or some sort of elevated railway could help take the pressure off. Part of it could be done by rewriting the tube map. Mm. You could solve a whole chunk of London's property problems if you... First of all, you have multiple designs of the tube map, so everybody uses a different one. Yeah. So the biases aren't compounding biases. They aren't compounding errors. So it's not locked into that one... So everybody's not locked into that same mental model. Yes. So, for example, people come to our office at Blackfriars from, say, St Pancras, and they go all the way around the circle line. Because Thameslink isn't on the tube map. Now, just to give you an example of this, most of the overground existed. Most of the overground existed as a railway before it was called the overground. It was called Silverlink Metro. Was a bit. Now, I once needed to get from Canary Wharf. Being a rail nerd, I once needed to get from Canary Wharf to Richmond, mm. and I actually went up to Stratford and took Silverlink Metro, which is now the overground, all the way around yeah. to the Thames. I mean, it's, it's like, it was like bad day at Black Rock. I mean, there was nobody on the platforms. It was just, you know, absolute ghost town. The interesting thing is, when they added it to the tube map and called it the overground, usage went up 400% in the first month. So there are whole areas of it. Now, the way I describe that is, you've just created £2 billion worth of infrastructure using ink. Because the infrastructure already existed for the most part. It's just people didn't know how to use it. It wasn't cognitively available. And so one really interesting thing would be experimenting with property shortages by actually displaying London in lots of different ways. So if you could encourage people to go to isochronic maps and dick around, they go, it's really weird, what's that blob there? Yeah. And of course, Ogilvy, in my case, I've got a colleague who lives in St Albans, which is on Thameslink. In his case, he sits at the front of the train. Beautifully, uh, Blackfriars Station is across the river. We're on the south bank. Mm. Uh, he effectively walks down a few flights of stairs, walks along the embankment, and he's 100 yards from our front door. Yeah. Now, the glory of that is he gets into London every day without actually experiencing any of the worst aspects of London, like traffic or t it's teleportation. Now, you know, if you'd encourage everybody at our office to play around with, with um, you know, uh, as I said, isochronic... It's like the isobar, you see. An isobar is a line of equal air pressure. Right. And an isochron is a line of equal journeying time. Uh, what people would do is they'd completely rethink what they wanted from London, yeah. I think. Yeah. So, so, so when I say that, 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 that there's always a perceptual element to everything because our own view of London is hugely distorted. Yes. Um, I mean, from Seven Oaks, just to give an example, there are some two and three bedroom apartments above Seven Oaks Station. 
Uh, by the way, don't move to some if you want nightlife. I will, just, just in case any young people take me my word, OK? Uh, the place is fucking dead after 10 o'clock night. But in every other respect, it's a very nice place to live. Um, now, you know, apartments above there mm. are 34 minutes from, some, uh, from Charing Cross, which is Trafalgar Square. Well, that's Fulham, isn't it? If you get on the tube at Fulham, Charing Cross, about 34 minutes, I guess. Yeah. Okay. But nobody thinks of the two places being even remotely comparable on any dimension at all. Okay, and so you know, part of part of the solution to property may be rebranding it, it, suburbia. It, it's it's totally fascinating what you're talking about here. Absolutely, you know, my mind's just going bloody hell because actually architects were very good at redefining how you perceive space, how you perceive the city, and you know the idea of using isochronic maps to be able to start um, redefining people's relationship to how London is interpreted. Yeah. Um, and that is a very powerful way for architects to communicate their value. And a lot of how the industry works at the moment is we're very reactive to... Because because all developers, by the way, in the 19th century and before were, brand, were branding guys. Because right. if you look at Fitzrovia, um, Pimlico, Bayswater was originally, they tried to call it Tyburnia, after the model of Belgravia. And they name those areas. And, of course, sometimes residents do it themselves with things like um, uh, Clam and, uh, you know... Um, Batersia. Batersia. St. And, and, uh, what was it? Collier's Wood was Bois, Bois des Charbonniers, I think it was, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, you know, people do it themselves. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, if everybody who lived in Hampstead really lived in Hampstead, it would be the third largest city in the... You know, people claim to live... North, I mean, North Kensington, of course, is the most dishonest piece of branding in, uh, uh, in, in London. Um, uh, but but all of those people were wise to that. Yes, then. yeah. Um, and somehow, uh, you know, being able to create that kind of... Because the great thing is, what you then do is, the reason people created brands is it destroyed the power of the shopkeeper. It restored some power of the uh, of the manufacturer to influence consumer choice, whereas otherwise the shopkeeper, you'd simply come in rather like the Soviet Union, you know, you'd say, I would like bread. Here is bread, okay? And by having branding and by attaching that branding to the product, uh, you regain... And it's very important, by the way, because you have a feedback loop, you see? Yeah. Capitalism doesn't work without branding because you can't reward good products by buying them again and punish bad products by boycotting them and dissing them to all your friends. Right. So the brand mechanism is really important to the working of capitalism. Yes. Um, because it's, the, it, it's what provides the feedback loop where good things get bought more and bad things get boycotted. And, um, and therefore, if you created brands around the quality of building rather than around the sodding location, okay... Now, I think we ought to give a bit of credit to... Barclay Homes probably deserve a little bit of a... Uh, you know, a little bit of a high, if not a high five, a sort of high three. Is that fair? Or would you... Would, would, depends. It depends. Yeah. They've done some, yeah, decent I, I'm probably scandalising a lot of architects here, aren't I? Yeah. Um, but, but, um, but, but, I mean, there's been a little bit of effort made in terms of architectural quality and so forth. Yeah. Um, I also think... This is a terrible one. Okay. I mean, um, I, I also think you could make planning permission... Um, allow for much more indulgence of interesting uh, buildings and architecture as well. Now, it's a terrible thing coming from Kent, and again, this is going to scandalise people, but nothing that's weatherboarded is altogether awful. Is, is, that, a, is that a... Okay. okay. <laughs> but, but, you know, I mean, you know what I mean? If you yeah. cover something... One of the weirdest... Okay, I, I'm going to change this and start questioning you. What's the problem? Okay. In the United States, they build their houses out of wood. Yes. And they have fucking tornadoes and hurricanes all the time. In Britain, we don't have tornadoes and hurricanes, and yet we won't build with wood to save our lives. Why is that? Because wood is nice, okay? Yeah, and there's, again, there's a perception about wood being something that's flimsy, or, that, you know, even, even now with kind of wood technology where it's at, and people, you know, you can build skyscrapers out of timber nowadays that are absolutely incredible. People still have the perception of, like, oh, how's fire rating? Is it going to yeah. burn down? Uh, oh, it... I see. Oh, but, like, but Americans it, don't have that same paranoia. Like, what, what, what's going on there? It's just, it's just what you're used to. Because in Scandinavia, okay, it can't exactly have a problem with retaining heat because Scandies do it. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. Okay. 
Um, generally, wooden shit is an order of magnitude less unpleasant than concrete or brick shit. Yeah. Um, uh, also, it would be interesting if you could create different forms of planning permission where there wasn't the assumption of permanence. There's this huge problem with the property thing, you see. A, the landowners get all the gains. B, the problem is you have property has a use value. It has a delight. I would argue it has a delight value, which is where architects come in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it also has an investment value. And the problem is that the investment value destroys the use value. Because mm. if you have to pay the price for your property that an investor pays, then that's more than you want to pay in terms of actual use and utility. And also it crowds out the delight value of a property as well. Yeah. Okay. Because investors probably aren't principally interested in that. Because they're not, they're not living there. Exa- they? Exactly, exactly. By to let people aren't, aren't actually living there. So the feedback loop's broken. And it's rather like having retailers deciding what chocolate gets sold rather than consumers. Yeah. Um, so, they, I mean, there's so much, I think, that could be done here to make something. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, A, one question is we should just build some more towns. Because if there is a problem with NIMBYs, don't build them in people's backyard build somewhere else. Yeah. So not far from Seven Oaks, a place called New Ash Green. It was a Canadian architect called the Span Group in the 1970s. And there's quite a lot of experimentation there with two things. One, you couldn't park next to your house, so you had a car park. I think you might be able to drop things off at your house, but then you had to go and park elsewhere to encourage people to meet. And there was also experiments with local democracy over how the place was run and funded. But the interesting thing is it's got a population of seven or 8,000. Mm. It's in the middle of a wood. No one in Seven Oaks even knows it exists. They've just seen it on the front of a bus. And so if you build in the middle of woods as part of rewilding, no one's going to care, right? Yeah. Okay? So, you know, stop building in people's backyards. That's the first brief. You know, and there are railway stations that serve basically bloody nobody where you could do that mm. to an extraordinary but degree of success. It, it, this is really interesting because it's, it's kind of, again, putting, putting architects back in a position of being, mm. you know, of her power and by leading pr- developments rather than waiting for the property developers to come to us to make something, squeeze something onto a site, we're reacting to it. Actually, the architects have a lot of skills and abilities to be able to reshift the perception of a piece of city. Oh, completely. Oh, completely. And, oh, completely. I mean, and and bring know, that factor of coolness to something. I mean, the one interesting thing, one great thing, by the way, <laughs> about living in a four-bedroom apartment, which is in a Robert Adam house, is you, n- you never suffer from property jealousy, you see. Because you go and see someone's three million pound, you know, flat in Cheney Walk, and your wife goes, what do you think of their flat? And I thought the architecture was a bit shit, <laughs> you know. And um, uh, so, you know, undoubtedly, one of the great lessons from psychology is that what you pay attention to becomes important. Mm. You'd think it's the other way around, okay? If, yeah. if people will decide what's important, and then they'll pay attention to that. Actually, if you use, I mean, literally, kind of showmanship to get people to pay attention to um, something, okay, that becomes important because they're paying attention to it. Mm. So it, the, 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 log, the flow of logic almost works backwards. If you want to sell the Eurostar, don't talk about speed because then people go, well, if, I, if, if it's all about speed, then I really need to fly to Paris. Talk about how comfy the seats are and the fact that there's Wi-Fi, yeah. and they'll go, well, why would I ever fly? Because now suddenly productivity and comforts become the deciding factor. And so you can, I think, use architecture. So if you take those websites in America, there's Right on the Market, which is Frank Lloyd Wright Properties for Sale. Yeah, there's yeah. the Modern House. There's one called Wow House, as in Bauhaus, only Wow House. Yeah. Um, uh, I would, I, if I moved, uh, I would pretty much always go to one of those places and make my decision, an architecture first decision. Um, and as a result, as I said, you're buying an extraordinary amount of both use value and what I call delight value um, very, very effectively. But the investment value is crowding out the whole thing. The investment value is forcing too many two-bedroom apartments to be built because they're perfect for investors, but they're pr- they're too small, too big for an individual, too small for a family. Yeah. Uh, so that you know that's a distortion on the whole market. And do, and do you think as well? There's there's a, there's a huge kind of restriction on the supply. I mean, with with houses in London particularly, there's a massive restriction on how many houses actually can be built, the supply of them, the price of land that becomes 
that, that means that these kind of the property developers are very slow to do anything else. And they're change. very conservative as well, yes. which is yeah. one of the things that's sad is I wish they could experiment a bit more, um, you know, in um, uh, because public opinion takes time to shift. As I said, this is a job which has to be done collectively. Yes. Um, uh, and... By the way, I think a lot of I think a lot of nimbyism is driven by the fact that the buildings are so bloody ugly, to be absolutely honest, and they're hideously overcrowded. Uh, in the you know the incentive to cram things in. Yeah, they they, they literally it, physically it, look it, bloated buildings. It, it, it's absurd. Yeah. You know? And so, um, what what you could do there would be interesting, which would be, I mean, so, at some level, it's absurd that all the gains from property permission go to the, the owner of the land, effectively. I mean, something's got to be done to kill that. Yeah. So you basically go, okay, um, uh, there must be a way in which you could ensure that developers were less greedy and having, once they bought the land at this inflated price, they then have to do an appalling uh, job. There must be experimental ways where we could change this. Mm. Um, where, for example, um, uh, you know, what, would, what might be interesting would be, um, you know, where, for example... Uh, you buy property for its use value and the capital gain returns to the local authority, for example. Um, and, and, you know, countries like Germany, which have never had, mm. particularly places like Berlin, although you have a problem with gentrification there, uh, interestingly, yeah. but places which have never had that same uh, problem um, as, as the UK, uh, you know, quite properly, your property should be an element of enjoyment. It shouldn't be principally considered as a pension. Yeah. Um, well, that's uh, it. Oh, the other thing, the other thing, by the way, is the extraordinarily... Now, could you, A, energy efficiency, okay, right, B, um, tech. Houses are fucking appallingly low tech, okay. I mean, the front door key is a ludicrous... You know, you need to have a key for emergencies, I accept that. But the fact that my car opens automatically when I walk towards it, but my house doesn't, should be an item of shame. I recently bought um, a, um, a Gerberit Aqua Wash toilet, which, a Japanese style. It, that, don't, don't call it... Is that the one with the, with the little the, the hose? The little thing out. comes and yes. washes your bum, right? <laughs> now, now, interestingly, it's technically actually Gerberit invented this, and the Japanese then cottoned on. So technically, we give the Japanese the credit because they've adopted it the most enthusiastically. It's an extraordinary, brilliant thing. And yet, only 1% of Toto's sales are to Western Europe. And when I bought it, someone sent me, the, I think, the particulars for number one Hyde Park and pointed out that you could buy a £150 million apartment and you'd still have to wipe your own ass <laughs> because it doesn't come with Japanese-style toilets, OK? And it might be that if you're that rich, someone else wipes your ass, in fairness. But, but um, uh, the... The low techness. I remember staying in the fifties. I mean, the United States. What say what you like about the U.S., but at its best, the architecture is fascinating. So, my brother-in-law lived in California, uh, in Los Angeles, where he had a house. Uh, it was a three-bedroom house. Two of the bedrooms were tiny, but it had the most brilliant arrangement I've ever seen. Mm. Where the main living area was two squares. In other words, about. 18 feet square, which overlapped by 50% at, at one edge, okay? So they were contiguous at 50% of, of an edge of each of them. Right, okay. And there was a screen you could close off, therefore, between the two. So this meant, in a sense, you could have a television room and a sitting room by splitting them in two, but if you wanted to hold, host a, a larger, well, I suppose a coke-fueled orgy, <laughs> given that it's California, given it's Los Angeles, but if you wanted to hold a mass party, you could just connect the two, and you had one huge room. If you divided, if you joined them together, again, you had two reasonably intimate rooms. Yes. You know, I stayed in a place in New York where there were rubbish chutes. I stayed in a place in Los Angeles where there was in-wall vacuum cleaning. So you have central vacuuming. So we just where there's a ruddy great machine in the basement. And you just plug a snake into the wall and immediately it turns on the vacuum in the basement and you hoover the floor. Everything goes down to the basement and is retrieved from there. You know, laundry chutes, uh, milk doors. You know, none of this stuff's being added. You know, the, what you, you know, and now, given... Given the advances in tech, 
there's something pretty shameful here, isn't there? There's something yeah. really, really we're, we're, um, crap about our ability to uh, you know, reinvent. Yeah, we're, we're, we're still literally using Roman technology, mm. basically, to build, to build houses. Yeah. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and it's bizarre as well, because in architecture school or in the architecture profession, there is this romance and love for technology, and the kind of academic world perhaps produces these incredibly speculative buildings being, you know, that are organically growing by themselves, being, you know, they're working with doctors and biologists about how buildings can reproduce themselves and are artificially... But then it's so divorced from actually how our cities get produced. I know, exactly. It, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of like, oof, okay. So Buckminster Fuller was ranting on about mass production of housing on the car model, you know, years ago, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And, when, and we're still struggling to have mass-produced houses or to, oh, in terms of, like, a design for manufacture houses. I worked, for, yeah. I, I worked for, um, for, for Rogers for a long time, and we were, and this was about 10 years ago, when we were sort of pioneering design for manufacturing in, in housing, using the kind of, and it wasn't that sophisticated technology, but to have any of the house builders adopt it was, was they were very, very reticent to do anything that was different to... And Simon, I'm, I'm, I mean... Consumers are a bit at fault there because I faced a bit of spousal resistance to my <laughs> bum wash toilet, uh, gibberish, aqua wash, bit of product placement. There you go. I'm all um, about the hose. The hose is. <laughs> but it's a fantastic thing. Partly, I think, because my you know people are very reluctant to look weird. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, th- th- there was one spectacular thing. I think there's a New York apartment where your car goes up in a lift. Is that right? Yes. So actually, yeah, your yeah. car is on the same floor as you are. Which did strike me as whether it was the most appalling thing or the most brilliant thing I've seen in thirty years. That was damn interesting. Yeah, you know, um, and um, uh, I mean, really interesting questions arise, of course, with things like if if Elon's work with batteries, you know, a kind of off the grid life. Mm. So the really interesting thing might be the electric motorhome, not the electric car. Yes. Because, you know, particularly if you could make the things slightly modular, okay, um, you know, I, I do occasionally wonder about buying 32 acres of woodland somewhere on the grounds that actually that's, you know, that's the future. Yeah. Well, and again, it's the, it's the, the nature of ownership of, house, of, of homes is totally ah. changing. Well, by the way, you mentioned that because you, by the way, that's a really interesting point because you've got, if you think about it, you've got use value, you've got delight value, you've got investment value. And with ownership, there's also a question of stability value, mm. which is I can invest in this, okay, without wasting my money, which conventional rental doesn't allow you to do. And I can now plan my life on certain basic assumptions, which renting doesn't allow you to do because you can be kicked out too easily. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I think all my father was a, a rental landlord, and nearly all landlords also make a mistake, by the way, because... If you've got a good tenant and he's been there for three years and inflation isn't particularly huge, drop the rent. Now, that sounds crazy. What happens is landlords get greedy. They try and put the rent up by 10%. They then have the place empty for four months, which costs them far more than they would have gained um, in rent for, you know, the next few years. Yeah. And the next tenant's an asshole. Okay. If you've got a good tenant, actually, the price should fall to reflect his diminishing level of risk. And I think there needs to be some sort of Amazon Prime version of rental where you can pay more up, for, you know. But anyway, we'll talk about that later. But, uh, but, but, but the, con- the continuity thing, in other words, we hate kind of instability or, you know, we kind of do, we're kind of territorial a little bit. Yes. And having that freedom that someone could actually create something which was permanent would be fascinating. Yes, yeah. Um, I did meet someone who's got a brilliant idea for doing this, by the way, very recently. And I, I'd love to describe it, but I'm sworn to secrecy. <laughs> but there is a very clever way in which you could do it. Um, but actually also working in behavioural science or marketing for a, uh, you know, a, a, a mass producer of housing. Uh, Simon Woodruff, by the way, of the founder of Yo Sushi, I don't know where it went. He had a very interesting idea about how you can make space m- multiple use. So my father, by the way, interestingly, has, I mean, for 30 years, has always thought that it's pretty stupid that bedrooms during the day have a sodding great bed 
on the floor, and that you should be able... Woodruff's idea was using the counterweights of stage scenery. You could make very large elements of a home completely movable. Because stage scenery, because it's counterweighted, you know, you could kind of lift up to yeah. immensely heavy things with one hand. Yes. And he had a plan to have very small apartments where, apart from the bathroom and shower, every single square foot had more than one use. So the study could be a second bedroom because the desk became a bed. Mm. And I'm fairly sure that um, you lifted your bed into the ceiling in the main room and it revealed a kind of conversation pit and wine cellar, patently showing one of Mr Woodruff's <laughs> interests. But that, that he said every single square foot of the thing, bar the bog, can basically serve more than one purpose. Yeah. And so you turn 400 square feet into 800 or 800 and 1600. And that, that, by the way, is also, by the way, kind of true. Mm. Um, we had a huge bit of luck with our four-bedroom apartment. We thought we were going to be there for six years and then outgrow it. But um, the two children, one of, the, one of the, the four bedrooms is up in the roof at the top of a spiral staircase. This is because it's weirdly aligned, okay? The other one is actually in the portico over the front, okay? Now, they're both tiny, but they're really weirdly located in shape. Now, our massive bit of luck was both our children wanted as their bedrooms the two weirdest but smallest rooms because they were kind of cosy and eccentric, leaving us with a room to turn into a study and a room to turn into a huge bedroom. And so that... Uh, you know, that's an interesting question, which is, you know, making the whole layout of buildings more eccentric. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, the level of sort of bourgeoisness around, you know, what function is designated to what room uh, is, is really well, pretty uh, sad. Uh, yeah, and I mean, and as an architect, I mean, we still struggle with getting things to be open plan with, with a client sometimes. And you're, 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 you know, fighting to have a flat roof for example. On they something. are worse, aren't they? <laughs> they're, they're, in maintenance terms, my father always hated flat roofs. Not now, not now. I mean, you're, 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 yeah, you're, you're pretty convinced you can, okay. get, you can get a good, yeah. get a good well-performing flat roof, um, you know, same as, a, same as a pitch roof if it's done, done properly. And, and now, I mean, you, you, I mean, this is interesting, isn't it? Because the, I'm pretty convinced that just as, if you like, the status currency of Humans are innately status-seeking creatures. Okay? Yeah. Forget about trying to get rid of that because it's not going to go away. We're chimps. You know, it's, it's embedded. Okay? But the currencies we use to compete for status change and, can, and actually can be changed as mm. well. And so just as, for example, urban millennials don't really... I don't know what any of my staff, ha whether they own a car or not, or what car it is. Now, in 1988, I knew all my colleagues what car they drove because you talked about it all the time. Now, interestingly, you can go to Machu Picchu and put it on Facebook, but you can't really put your Ford Mustang on Facebook if you're an urbanist um, millennial. And so as a result, they're obsessed with travel. Mm. Um, but not very interested in cars. Yeah. Now, I think you could create a generation which is obsessed with architectural and design quality and with sustainability. Yes, yes. Not, uh, not just sustainability. Well, well, this, nobody does something shit out of pure altruism, but you can get people to do very, very altruistic things if you bake in a little bit of selfishness. Well, this, this is an interesting question, actually, is, is the, you know, our architects, we're, we're very passionate about sustainability and mm. having, you know, we're very aware of how much mess the construction industry makes and being able to market if you like or build a brand for sustainability a lot of the times it's kind of like a, it's in the context of a big make wrong and a, and a kind of fear-based make make you know we've got to do this otherwise it's the end of the world type of thing and it and it's becomes doesn't always land very well with developers and our clients and, and um, actually it's um the way to sell it is that sustainability provides an answer to the question, where do you live? Okay, so if you want to live in an area where land is less expensive, but you say, I live in a, this new sustainable... I mean, what? okay, Bexley would probably be, okay, which Londoners don't even realise is in London, okay. But if you, if you say, where do you live? And you say, I live in Bexley, you know, basically, uh, 
you're going home alone. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know, I, always, uh, I always think that part of the reason the young people are obsessed with living in Hackney is, as I said, you know, if you live in Bromley, you can't pull. You know, you know people go, well, if I go home to Bromley and I discover he's a loony, you know, I've got a £50 tax and doing it. But if you just said, um, actually, I'm looking at this really new sustainable... Now, if you said, I'm looking to move to Bexley, right? You know, basically, you know, everybody will shuffle off. Oh, it's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. But if you said there's this new sustainable development in Bexley, and there's a great paper written by Sanford Bernstein, mm. um, flatteringly, I might say, self-flatteringly, slightly influenced by something I wrote, yeah. which says that um, actually sustainability is now part of the pro- product cycle. It's a reason to innovate, okay? So in order, capitalism, marketing, in order to get people to continue to buy stuff, Okay. Yeah. Have to give them a new reason to buy something. Yeah. Okay. And in many cases, the reason that companies are now putting in is is precisely sustainability. It's a reason for you to change your behaviour because the products are all doing. The, you know, basically most products. The, you know, for all the faults of capitalism, it produces an enormously high range of shit that's pretty good yeah. at doing the job it's supposed to do. And so in order to find a way to differentiate yourself or innovate, sustainability, out of pure selfishness on the part of the competitive business, is one of the planks they can actually choose to invest in. And actually, I would say that sustainability is is that's the way you get young people to move to Bexley. Mm. I mean, you know, know, I I just put 100 quid down for a Tesla, okay? And um, the... Ultimately, the reason I'm doing it, I'm buying a smaller car than I already have, etc. And the reason I'm doing it is, I, you know, is that I need to change my car, and I can't really think of a reason to change my car or to improve it other than sustainability. And I have got to the point where using a petrol car feels incongruous. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And also. Um, the, you know, as I mentioned about the Carnot theory, the Tesla comes with dog mode, um, which is you, how you set the air conditioning on your car. But even cleverer, what they're frightened of, of course, if you leave a dog in a car on a hot day, other people who don't understand the Tesla's dog mode will assume the dog is in distress. Oh, and, like and so dog mode window. actually comes, to stop them smashing the window, it comes with a display on the screen that says, don't worry, my owner will be back soon, and the temperature inside is a comfortable 69 degrees Fahrenheit, you see. Now, the interesting thing is that massively appealed to me, even though I don't have a dog. Um, and so, uh, you know, in a sense, it's a form of novelty, which is if I'm going to do a new thing, which, you know, um, there's no point in just doing a new version of the old thing because I spend a load of money and I get something that's... It, it, it's just like... It's, it's what I always say when I went bed, shopping for bedding with my wife, Okay. Um, I weirdly said, look, can I make a deal with you? I said, we're, we're here in this bedding department. Can we spend one of two amounts of money? Nothing or a lot. Okay. And she was, well, it doesn't make any sense. She's used to saying that. Okay. And I said, no, no. If we spend, I, I'm kind of happy with our existing bedding. Okay. Yeah. I'm cool with it. You know, if we spend £200, we've got the same bedding we had before, but a bit kind of fresher. Well, I've spent 200 quid, and I don't really get anything new out of this. You know, I don't get an endorphin rush out of going, oh, we've got some new sheets, right? If we spend nothing, I've saved 200 quid, so I can go and buy a drone. Right? <laughs> On the other hand, if we spend quite a lot, I can get excited by tog values and Egyptian cotton and Oxford pillowcases and mattress toppers, turn it into a project, mm. and actually notice something new. Yeah. And so, in a sense, the environmental movement can harness human neophilia. Yes. Okay. I think that's why the Dyson works, right? Which is uh, so. How how it effectively works is that um, if I if I move from my existing house to a sustainable house, Dyson, I was talking about yes, Dyson yeah, yes. on the phone rang. Okay. Which is oh shit, the vacuum cleaner's fucked. Okay. Oh god, we're going to spend two hundred quid. And I can spend, you know, I spent 200 quid and I get a vacuum cleaner that's like an old vacuum cleaner. So I've, I've spent 200 quid and I have moved forward, okay? I'm just where I was before. On the other hand, if I spunk 500 quid on a Dyson, it's a lot more money, but I've actually got something different, yes. right? Yeah. I've actually got, you know, I've actually got something which goes, wow, this is cool, you know? Yeah. Ooh, attachments, you know? Ooh, bagless. <laughs> and so I think you can use sustainability in that way. Mm. As a marketing tool, which is, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got a house which miraculously opens the top when it gets too hot and does weird things, you know, um, and, and yeah, 
I can't wait to get solar panels, not to save the money, but just for the geekishness of, you know, going mm, four kilowatt hours today. Yeah. You know, I, you know. It's kind actually, of celebrating the performance I, of the it. Way I was, okay, it's the way you get people to do better things is by making it a bit selfish or novel or... So nobody washed and bought soap in 1920. Ants for pear soap didn't say, wash with pear soap and help prevent a cholera outbreak, did they, right? They didn't speak to the big overarching social good. They basically said, if you don't wash with soap, with our scented soap, uh, you'll die single and alone. It was all really Darwinist, you know. It was all about if you smell, if your house is dirty. You know, they're unbelievable kind of anxiety-promoting things. Promoting selfish benefits, the scent... Yeah. Whereas the big collective benefit, which is the fact that the soap was also act antibacterial, was almost left to the left to the background. Yeah. And in the same way, I think the way to sell environmentalism is fuck me, this house is cool, and it's also environmental. Yes. And I think Tesla's done that fantastically, yes. right? I mean, I know it's environmentally clean, it's electric, da 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 da. I'm you know, I'm conscious of all that stuff. Um, but at the same time, that on its own doesn't get me to act. Okay, whereas dog mode does. Now, I know that makes humans seem unbelievably trivial and stupid, but the fact is we are, okay? <laughs> so let's just live with that, okay? That's how we perceive the world, that's how we act. There's not much you can do to correct that without making people no longer recognisably human, okay? Yeah. So let's park that project, because, you know, various authoritarian regimes have already tried that, okay? And let's just actually work with the grain of human nature. Yeah. Wonderful. And, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, the, the one thing I would probably move house to would be if someone came up with a really cool, and that would also mean not only sustainable, boring sustainable house, not going to buy it. They bought a really cool house, which was also sustainable. Okay. Now I'm interested. Okay. If it's got, you know, weird features like, you know, I, I mean... Easter eggs. We need more Easter eggs. And by the way, that could be just a really eccentric room, you know, you, you know, an observatory. I don't know. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But um, but I mean, there must, and I I think that way of of and the other interesting thing about that, of course, is you can't find what appeals to people through market research because they themselves don't know until they've seen it. Mm. And so this is why you need much more experimentation in architecture, because it's only when you experiment that you discover what people really want. Yeah. You know, in a sense, centralised capitalism wouldn't work that badly if people could articulate exactly what they wanted in advance. The truth of the matter is we don't have introspective access to a lot of the things that drive our behaviour. Mm. And so, uh, the, you know, uh, what, what, would be, what would be glorious, okay, is if... If one of the large, larger developers uh, or, a, or a collective of developers just had a skunk works and said, we're just going to put 20%, well, you know, we're going to keep on doing what we're doing, we're just going to put 20% into the skunk works because four out of five of the things we try first will fail, mm. okay? But if we, if we find a really miraculous success, like young people, you can get them to move to Bexley if, right? You know, whatever it may be, if you can just find a hack that works, then the gains from that hack way more than that pays the cost of the four failures. Yeah. And so bees do this. 80% of bees obey the Wuggle Dance, 20% of them are the skunk works. And it's a, what, what's called exploit, explore. 80% of your efforts exploiting what you already know. I know where these flowers are. I know they've got pollen. I know they've got nectar. We will exploit that knowledge. But then the 20% of bees, which at first glance look like an inefficiency, because they fail frequently, are there to explore what you don't yet know. So it's, it's kind of like deliberately uh, creating a mutation, if you like, in, in, your, mm. in your creativity and just experimenting. Mutation is exactly the right word, because yeah. it's exactly how evolution works. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that would be something I'd really, really like, you know, I mean, any kind of property skunk works. And I mean, uh, old um, Frank, Lloyd Wright, um, uh, he had that, um, the prairie homes where actually you could order the designs off the page, couldn't you? Now, having some sort of national competition, I've tried to get the spectator to do something similar, which is... Because you do have that weird committee for the built environment, don't you, which Roger Scruton was forced to resign from. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I mean, that, that sort of stuff just bores, bores the hell out of me. Like, you know, 
art of, of synthetic scandal. Yeah. And, and, it, and, it's, and it's, and it's, again, that kind of stuff, particularly what's happened, that's very devoid from a lot of current architectural thinking, and it's very traditional in many aspects. And yeah. I mean, the traditional people, I suppose, are right about some stuff, which yes. is that over-design, leaving room for, um, uh, you know, so uh, that to some extent the process will always be a bit organic. Mm. That business where you actually wait to see where people walk and you don't put concrete down until you see where the muddy paths are, there's an element of that I think you have to leave room for uh, in everything. These, 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 yeah, these kind of emergent strategy, yeah. The, the, yeah. And the other one weird, weird thing would be, so do you remember we talked about, okay, with property, there's use value, investment value, delight value. Yes. And also what you might call stability value. Um, it, it's interesting to me, I mean, you know, if you take Airbnb, which was experimenting quite heavily with different lock technologies, it occurred to me that if you had, let's say, a second home where you had a key to it all the time and depending on an app on your phone which was either green or red you could you know on the calendar you could either use the property or you couldn't yeah that could actually use technology to mimic what you might call ownership value mm. the sense of ownership that you know there might be really clever both financial mechanisms legal mechanisms but technological mechanisms and that perceptual mechanisms to be able to yeah to to, to create that Feeling that experience of stability. Be, no, no hotel. I mean, I imagine hotels would do this if you asked nicely. But to to pay a small amount to have a right to use a a building full of micro homes in London, but where you also had a small amount of storage, because then if you can leave your shit there, the reason I own a second home in Deal in Kent, um, and it's just a, a, a two bedroom maisonette uh, thing. But the reason you own it, okay, is largely because I could I could go down there now on the train. Uh, I've got the key. Yeah, I've got the key. Okay, and I could basically I've got clothes there. I've got underpants there. I've got a charger for my laptop. Okay, I put my phone on a charger rather than having to retrieve a cable. All that, and of course, I can arrive and leave at random times. Okay, without yeah. the feeling that I have to, you know, meet someone at two to hand over the key. Now, so technology, in some ways, can I think provide some really interesting psychological hacks in terms of what ownership means? Because if you have a place where essentially a you've got a degree, I went to see a. a, a I've always had this idea that fractional ownership and timeshare was such a brilliant idea. Okay, that the trouble was because it was such a brilliant idea, it was very very lucrative, which attracted a load of crooks which therefore discredited the whole category. Right. But I went to see an interesting Madeira fractional ownership development where the bedroom had four wardrobes and each of the four owners had one of the wardrobes. And then you went down into the basement and there were four things the size of a garage where you could keep a canoe or a sailing dinghy or a, well, you wouldn't keep a surfboard, I suppose. I don't know what you keep there. But you could keep a whole load of stuff. I mean, literally, you could keep, you know, wardrobes of stuff there. And again, each owner had one of the four. So essentially, when you arrived at your house, you just unlocked wardrobe number three, and there was your mm. stuff there. That's fascinating, isn't it? Which is fascinating, like, isn't it? What, it so, what does ownership actually yeah, mean? Yeah, and, and how and how a small some gesture or yeah, something gestural exactly. and symbolic, yeah, something can small change and the, physical, change the way you feel. Absolutely yeah. fascinating. But but an invitation to anybody in in your category. This is not you know anybody who's trying to trying to innovate or do something significantly new in the property space. Mm. Uh, I'd love to hear from you just to, from a sort of behavioural science point of view yeah. of you know, what it takes to... Um, um, I mean, an interesting one would be if you founded a huge sort of innovative property club and you got young people to join and you could continually market to them electronically, mm. this is the new stuff that's continually happening, OK? If, if, you've been, you know, if you go to the modern house, OK, uh, roughly speaking... Uh, six times a month, okay? You're never going to buy a conventional house. Yeah. Okay? If you get a prime location, you're going to end up with a conventional house. So if you can change the frame of comparison, the choice architecture, and the path dependency of choice mm. uh, in the way people look for housing... Um, there are a few other interesting experiments with rental housing. Uncle, which is, I think, a guy called Ryan Prince, uh, has developed a brand for the landlord which is their, you know, their property developments for rental, yeah. where there's actually a kind of 
because uh, if you think about it, you're paying a stack of money to your landlord, but again, all you have is his own individual reputation. There's no bigger brand to mm. be built. You know, and actually, a good landlord is worth paying a premium for. Yeah. Right? A good tenant is worth, uh, you know... So it's, them, it's, it's, actually, it's actually like Uber. It's a two-way market, yeah. actually. Um, good tenant, you can lower the, ri- lower I, the I, risk. I genuinely, and my father always said that. Look, if you've got a good, dependent, long-term, reliable tenant... Do what you can because that continuity and, you know, all, I mean, one arsehole, you know, in one month can undo a hell of a lot of, you know, a hell of a lot of gains. And so, and, and by the way, I mean, we ought to remember this, okay? Landlords are routinely vilified, sometimes within reason. But my God, you got to remember, the worst 15% of tenants are awful. I mean, really, really awful. Not necessarily awful, by the way, in that they trash the place, they have parties. That's one kind of awful. But the other kind of awful is uh, the litigious tenant who keeps trying to sue you because the bath is dripping, you know, or the totally anally retentive tenant who complains about things that, um, uh, you know, no sane person would care about. Mm. So, I mean, there are quite, you know, you know, there are two or three ways in which a landlord can be awful, but there are ten ways in which a tenant can be awful. Yes. So we mustn't forget in that sort of, in this new trend to vilify landlords, um, we mustn't forget that it's a two-way street. Yes. It's fascinating. It's this idea of a, a kind of property club. I mean, I've spoken before with a colleague of mine, we've you know, talked about doing developments or having uh, a more like a subscription-based model for, for renting. So you, yep. you kind of, you know, you kind of pay a monthly subscription, you've got access to... 15, 20 different properties over a certain period of place, uh, over a certain area. It could even be international type of thing. It's kind of that sort of non-material. Well, that would be a really interesting way. If you live in Bexley, but, but, but you get three weeks a year in, in Lisbon. Brooklyn. Yeah, Lisbon. yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. I mean, that, I mean, that's another way in which you could Make get people... Make it cool, to, yeah. But anything, anything that kills this bloody... I mean, there's a very good anthropologist, I think, who said to me, when, when anybody in London meets anybody in London, their first question is, where do you live? And if you can get the, them to answer the question, you know, in the sort of inner huff house, rather than location, okay, I mean, that, that will be a huge change. Because at the moment, I mean... It was Harpo Marx, wasn't it, who said, I think, buy land because that's the one thing they're not making anymore. Yeah. And the extent to which landowners have a stranglehold over this is deeply damaging to the economy. Mm. I mean, New Yorkers have said to me that New York, under rent control, had the most fantastic nightlife. I'm probably too fantastic, you know. Um, but it had the most fantastic nightlife because there was all this disposable income mm. kicking around, okay? You know, I mean, I suddenly noticed that Young people are kind of boring now. And I suddenly realised it's because they've got no discretionary income. Because, you know, property is soaking this all up. And actually, if they've bought their, you know, massively in thrall to a mortgage, they're renting, you know, it's soaking up a huge amount of their expenditure. And um, so anything that cracks this problem yes. would be yeah, yeah. utterly fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. And you can crack it. You've, what you've just got to do is you've just got to get people... Advertising pulls this trick, okay. I'll tell you that. I always tell the story, so apologies to people who've heard it before. So I'm landing at Gatwick Airport, and you know that business where the plane's engines wind down, you're still a mile from the airport building, and you go, oh, shit, it's going to be a bus, right? Now, if you change the story, if you change the frame of comparison, you change the perception, right? You don't have to change the thing itself. You just have to tell, get people to look at it in a new way, and you can totally get people to reevaluate something. And this example is a case where the pilot, oh, fuck, it's going to be a bus. And the pilot says something ingenious, which is an ad. Okay. I'm afraid I've got some bad news and some good news, he says. Uh, the bad news is I won't be able to get you an air bridge because there's a plane blocking the gate. The good news is that the bus will take you all the way to passport control so you won't have far to walk with your bags. We all looked at each other and thought, I never thought of it like that before. That the bus isn't just an inconvenience, it's a conveyance. And I don't have to walk through loads of Kafkaesque corridors to get to passport control and baggage reclaim because the bus takes me right there. Okay. And if you, if you do that on a plane, people are actually now quite glad there's a bus. Mm. Particularly someone like Skipple, where it's sodding miles. You know. And you could do the same thing. If you get people to focus on property from an architectural quality, sustainability, technology, any standpoint like that. Why is Apple the most valuable com- company in the world? 
because it got people not to ask what's the clock speed, what's the memory capacity. It, it stopped people looking at phones by what they could do, and it got them looking at what it feels like while you're doing it. Yes. And by, by changing the frame of comparison and by owning the new, uh, the new dominant consideration, it's now worth a trillion dollars. And um, you know, if, if, if I have one regret, it's probably that if Jobs had got into the property and development business, Musk might, in a weird way, Elon Musk might with these weird batteries, because they, they do change a lot, don't they, when you think yes. about it, those batteries, potentially. Yeah. yeah. No, exactly. Um, it gives them potential for completely off-grid types Completely of off-grid, like mobile phone, okay, email arrives wherever you are, uh, you've got a 4G, 5G connection, uh, you're off the grid. Uh, okay, you've got a really great solar panel somewhere. Um, actually, you know, that that changes the game. Yeah. Because you put the damn thing on wheels, make it notionally movable, and um, you've just hacked planning, haven't you? Yes. I suppose there is one, one example I can give. A perfect place to end, okay. Where, which killed that where do you live thing, which was to answer a houseboat. And that might be a clue you see what I mean? Yes. I, I was, I was going to say, actually, um, when I, I used to live on a houseboat, actually. and and and, predictable. And, yeah, it okay, was, yeah, and, yeah. As a, and as a young man in my 20s, it was the best thing to say on a night out where you lived. I live, on a, houseboat. I live on a houseboat. And, uh, yeah, to beat it, them it, off the back. <laughs> Shit, <laughs> man. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, no. You couldn't answer that. What, what is a better answer than that? There's no better answer. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. And it, likewise, if you created a branded development, somebody's doing this a little bit. Um, again, um, who was it who got Philip Stark? Oh, yes, made. Okay, so I've just met um, Brent uh, Hoberman. Yeah. Okay. And when they started made, they got Philippe Stark to the board of directors and design some of the furniture. If you got a first-rate architect to you know, design the central thing and then young aspiring architects design the thing around it. Again, that's that you could use a, a mixture of rock star architecture and young talent yeah. to create something which gets complete reappraisal. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. What a pleasure. Rory, Fantastic. thank you so much. Oh dear. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15 minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.